Um, with us tonight, our speaker is uh, Dr. Julia Parrish, who is the Associate Dean in the College of the Environment and Professor of Ocean Fishery Sciences at the University of Washington. She is a marine biologist and conservation biologist. She has conducted research on seabirds for more than 30 years, focusing on factors, natural and human, that cause seabird populations to decline. Julia is a founder and executive director of the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team with the acronym COAST, which is housed at the University of Washington. As many of you know, COAST is a citizen science program that we're about, a, are about to hear about in great detail involving hundreds of participants who collect data each month on the identity and abundance of beach cast birds and marine debris. So I hope we have some coasters here. I know we have one that's actually in Spokane now, but it's been a coaster in the past, volunteering. Um, and uh, give yourself a, a round of applause or pat on the back for uh, being part of that great citizen science project. And for 25 years, the Coast team has tracked and analyzed patterns of seabird mortality on local beaches, beaches from California all the way to Alaska. These collected environmental uh, data offer the opportunity to learn things about natural history over time and space that no research lab could hope to attain on its own. That's the beauty of citizen science. We again thank Dr. Perry for coming to speak to us. Uh, this is not her first time. She spoke to Waz back in 2004. We should have you more often. Uh, and so with that, we welcome Dr. Parrish and we'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks, David. Thanks for that introduction. That's uh, that's just great. If there are any coasters in the audience, can you put your digital hand up? Then we can see you in participants. Uh, I don't see anybody. At least I don't see anybody putting their hand up. I know there's at least one of you out there. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to put my hand up. Oh, Judy. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, no, I'm not. Hold on. Now I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Good mess. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, well, thanks for um, coming out digitally uh, for tonight's WASP meeting. And I'm really, really happy. Um, to be back, as David said, it's been a few years since I uh, did a presentation, and Coast has grown quite a bit in the uh, in the meantime. So uh, I thought I'd uh, spend these next minutes um, telling you about seabirds and citizen science. So I want to start with this question: um, Really, can citizen science be another part of the toolbox of citizen science? And of course, I wouldn't be here talking to you if I said no. Um, yes, definitely. Let me just uh, run you through some of uh, the types of citizen science so that you can be um, thinking about that. There's ever more um, crowdsourcing with uh, camera traps. So this is a, one of my favorite projects that actually takes place in Antarctica, the Waddell seal count. So researchers are putting out uh, cameras in the uh, way frozen environment and getting um, tens of thousands of images of seals. And while artificial intelligence can basically say it's just snow or there's bodies in the snow, people can actually uh, create quite a lot, of, quite a rich database uh, about what's going on. So this uh, program, the Waddell Seal Count, is on a platform called the Zooniverse. Uh, and you might want to go there if you like to be an armchair um, citizen scientists, because at any one time, there are about 150 different platforms, I mean, excuse me, different citizen science programs on Zooniverse, almost all image-based like this one. Uh, citizen science can also be used to deploy sensors. This is one of my favorite sensor deployments. This is SmartFin. Um, it is an interaction between Scripps uh, uh, Institute of Oceanography, which is in La Jolla uh, in San Diego. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and uh, uh, a large um, surfing uh, program called uh, Surf Rider Foundation. 
smart fins are sensors that uh, do temperature recording and they can be snapped onto a surfboard. The trace that you're looking at here, the blue is the Scripps Pier temperature and all of those black dots um, come from smart fins that are on the bottom of surfboards of folks that are surfing off the, off the uh, Scripps Pier there. So really nice way of um, getting surfers to collect uh, physical data over uh, anywhere that they're surfing. And there are also lots of programs that collect um, samples. This is Muscle Watch. Uh, and um, so this is a great program um, where people are collecting not just mussels, but also oysters and other kinds of uh, shellfish. And this uh, is really great because they are then sent on to labs that are analyzing them for all sorts of, for instance, toxins. Uh, and so that's a, um, also a really, really great thing. And it um, goes right back to basically keeping our seafood safe. And that's something that everybody wants. Gemma, why can I not go there? Uh, of course, this is everybody's favorite, right? eBird. Um, it is a fantastically, fantastically successful citizen science program with 100 million um, sightings annually. And the really key thing I think about eBird is it's flexible. Um, it allows you to construct a checklist in the way that you want to and your time and your space uh, where, where all of those checklists are then um, verified by regional experts. Um, and the lovely thing is that they are then integrated nationally and internationally into a very rich database um, and uh, rebroadcast on the eBird site for instance, in occurrence maps or occurrence movies. They're just fantastic. They're mesmerizing to watch. Um, I just wanna put a plug in for these kinds of citizen science programs um, that are monitoring kind of bad things. This is Crab Team. It monitors invasive species um, of, of one kind, the European green crab um, in uh, the Salish Sea, or at least um, the Salish Sea south of the border. But the citizen science program that I'm gonna spend most of tonight um, talking about is the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team, or COAST for short. Um, COAST is not about live birds. COAST is actually about beach cast birds or birds that wash in on the tide. Most of those are gonna be marine birds, seabirds, sea ducks, and shorebirds. Uh, but there are actually quite a few terrestrial birds um, that will uh, literally run out of gas uh, over the water, fall into the water, um, and uh, and wash ashore. So COAST has been going, um, uh, we're just headed into our 25th year. We have between 380 and 400 sites. We work in about 90 coastal communities um, from just south of Mendocino in Elk, California, running all the way on up uh, um, to Cape Flattery, down the strait, we pick up Puget Sound and the San Juans. We skip over British Columbia, but we have a sister program, British Columbia Beach Bird Survey, who uses our protocols uh, and our field guides. Uh, and we pick up in Southeast. We run along the Gulf of Alaska, out the um, Alaska Peninsula, all the way out the Aleutian Islands to Russia, leap over the Alaska Peninsula into the Bering Sea, go north to the Chukchi, and tuck around the corner in the Arctic Circle to Uktiavik, or the former Barrow. Right now we have between 700 and 800 um, active participants in the program. Uh, and all of those people for all of those years, maybe uh, 5,500 or so, have logged in about 93,000 uh, carcasses of about 207 different species. But here's the Coast Science team. It's not the team at the University of Washington um, where I am stationed. It's all of the people on the beach. Um, and I would say that the single factor defining these people are not that they're bird experts, um, but they are dead bird experts. More on that in a minute. Um, but that they have a real strong love of place and their place is the coast. So they go to a beach or perhaps more than one beach uh, they walk there regularly, they take their dog for a walk, they walk with their partner, they take their grandkids, they uh, go out with their best friends there on the weekend, or their co-workers, or they actually work there, for instance, they're rangers. So all of these people are very, very attached to place, and they're very observant, just like you are. They notice a lot about what's going on. And so Coast just gives them one more way 
of seeing their uh, their beach, their environment. Uh, what's doing coast beach birds mean? Well, depending on where you are, uh, it's about one to five hours a month. We ask people to go out monthly to survey a beach and they're doing two things. They're surveying, so they have a set start point uh, and they're searching the entire beach to a set turnaround point. Most beaches are about a kilometer in length, some are more, a few are less, um, and they're searching for, uh, for bird carcasses. So in non-birdy areas, for instance, the Puget Sound, it's not even gonna take an hour because the beaches are also very small. But on the outer coast of Washington, for instance, and in the Southern outer coast of Washington, particularly, uh, might take quite some time down into Oregon and California, uh, quite a lot of time, especially at uh, particular times of year. So uh, one or more people, teams of people are searching the beach and when they find a carcass, they are collecting evidence about it. Three measurements, um, they're identifying the foot type, they're collecting information on the condition of the carcass. Is it intact? Is it partial? Has it been scavenged? Is it mummified? Um, they're also using our field guide to identify the carcass uh, and they're photographing it. So how do we identify uh, dead birds. One of the things that we realized right away is that we had to come up with a field guide that everybody uh, could understand. So it doesn't actually look like this. Um, our West Coast guide looks like this. And basically, we tell people coming into a trainee that you only have to know two things to be successful on coast. One is what's in front of you is a bird, and the other one is it's dead. If you know those two things, really in five hours, we can train you up. Let me prove that to you. So this is how identification happens in coast. There's no guessing, right? This is a die or um, try or multi key. So uh, we start with the feet in coast. Uh, we answer a few questions until we get to a stop sign in the foot key. That takes you to a foot type family. For instance, this foot type family, Alcids. Uh, you then follow the arrow, arrows, answer a few more obvious questions about the bird until you get to a box with a stop sign, and that takes you to one or more species pages. Um, puffins uh, are shown here. Okay, we're also collecting photographic evidence and um, let me impress upon you that a dead bird is very, very easy to take a photograph of. You can brush the sand off it. You can take a stiff paintbrush and brush the um, body feathers back down into place. You can put a scale ruler in um, or a slate. This is a coast slate um, telling us what beach, what date, what species uh, and what tag number. Uh, coasters are actually also using this ancient but tried and true technology called paper and pencil. Uh, and we actually use that on the beach because it turns out uh, it's hard to use cell phones uh, and cell phone apps uh, on the beach when it's raining or the sun's out and there's too much glare. Uh, people tend to do really bad things like drop their cell phones in the ocean and that's not good. Uh, but right in the rain paper, if you drop it uh, in the ocean, you can just pick it up shake it off, put it back on your clipboard um, and uh, and write on it. Uh, quite seriously, these data sheets are turned into Coast either via snail mail uh, or they're scanned and turned into us. So we have a full record of all of the stages of the data and we use that as chain of custody uh, in case we ever have to go to court, for instance, in an oil spill. So how good are coasters? It turns out that when people come to a coast training, they're not very good. When we ask them, what do you think that your level of birding uh, knowledge is? Only about 15% of people uh, coming to a coast training will say, well, I am, I'm an expert birder. That's actually a super narrow sliver. Or I feel that I'm an expert birder. That's about 15%. Fully half of the people walking into a coast trainer either identify themselves as beginning birders or actually they have no experience birding. They've never gone out and identified bird, birds at all. So this is a pretty um, starter crowd that's coming uh, into coast. Now this graphic is telling us something about how good coasters are. Let me walk you through this. On the horizontal or the x-axis is the previous experience. How many dead birds, how many carcasses have you identified? Do you have under your belt? And so as you go out farther on that um, axis to 400 or 500 birds, these are people that have been with Coast for a long time. And each dot is one or more people who have this, um, 
uh, same uh, experience and um, the, the same accuracy, which is the Y axis or the horizontal axis. And that is uh, on average, how many times are you gonna get to, to species correctly for a dead bird? And you can see the red line is just a, a statistical estimation of all of the data. You can also see that when you go down towards zero birds, those dots get bigger, and that's because there are more people in them. So there are a whole bunch of people in coast that are always just starting coast. So they've just come to a training, for instance, in the ocean shores that I ran last weekend, or they're in a really non-birdy place like Puget Sound, where they could go out for two years to their beach and never find a bird. So you can see that nobody's up at 100%, but people are, are pretty darn close uh, to there. And we use this model to just ask a theoretical question. How good are you at bird zero? So just before you get your first bird, but you've done the training, how good are you? And the answer to that is walking out of a training at bird zero, you're about at 70%. So the training itself gets you to seven out of 10 carcasses correct a species, which is amazing. And you can get better than that. You can see that that red line goes up and then it sort of plateaus. It plateaus after about a year um, at 87%. So almost nine out of 10 species correct. Um, that 10th species is really hard to get, mainly because there are a lot of rare species that come in that aren't in the field guide. So what do we do with the data? We publish it uh, in the peer-reviewed literature, but lots of people, especially lots of coasters, don't wanna read the peer-reviewed literature. They're not into science jargon, um, but they are into science updates. So you can go to the news and views section of the Coast website, uh, and you can read a coastified version of those science stories that not only tells you the salient points of the story, but also uh, focuses in on one of the scientists and tells their story as well. So if you want to know more about Coast, you can go to the Coast website. That's www.coastwith2s.org. Here's the landing page. Um, if you want to know uh, more about joining Coast, you can go to join our team uh, and flip to the trainings, or you can just go down the main uh, landing page until you get to upcoming events. You can see, for instance, um, uh, an upcoming event uh, training in Florence, another training in Pacific City. And then we have a special online training program called Coast Light, uh, which we do periodically. And the next one of those is the 21st of April. Okay, so you're probably thinking about this. So what? So there's this big program and they um, collect all sorts of information about beach birds and they've got 90,000 carcasses in their digital archive. So what? Let me tell you some of the science stories. This is the most important thing we do, and that is the natural history of dead birds. So you might have thought that natural history was only about live birds, but I'm here tonight to tell you that there is a natural history of dead birds, and that is who dies where and when. So what you're looking at here is data from Northern Oregon, uh, and it's across months of the year, um, and it stretches to a little more than a year, April of 2016 through May of 2017. Um, and the y-axis here is how many bird carcasses would you expect to find in a lineal kilometer of beach? And the um, average, the long-term average is that black line, um, and the yellow wash around it is a variability signature. So um, you can see that the long-term normal of a place, which is created by all of the beaches in Northern Oregon and all of the years that we've been collecting data for a particular month. So this baseline pattern or normal pattern suggests that in the spring, uh, you only find about one carcass per kilometer, but come uh, mid to late summer and fall, that'll spike up to uh, between four and six carcasses per kilometer, drop down a little bit in the winter and then go way back down in the spring. So that is um, the pattern of normal. And once we have that pattern of normal, um, we can ask questions about it. What are the gray bars? The gray bars are what happened in any particular year. In this case, between 2016 and 2017. And you can see that um, in those years, the gray bars, pretty much echo what's happening for the long-term normal. That is, it was a pretty normal or an average year. But let me show you the year before. 
really not normal. Now that mountain range that I showed you that was the long-term normal appears very flattened. And that's because I had to extend the y-axis or the encounter rate all the way up to 14 carcasses per kilometer because in August and September of 2015, there are a lot more birds washing in. Now over the entire coastline of Northern Oregon, at nine to 14 carcasses per kilometer per day, that's about 3000 carcasses every day. So that's actually quite a lot of birds uh, washing in to Northern Oregon. So that is a not normal year where there's a wow out. But sometimes we have a true disaster, a really not normal year. So this is the year before 2014, 15. And you can see now that that mountain range that was long-term normal just appears to be a flat line. You can hardly even see any difference in it. And that's because I've had to stretch up the y-axis all the way above um, 30 carcasses per kilometer. So at 32 carcasses per kilometer on average in those two months, December and January of 2014, 2015, 8,000 carcasses a day washed onto the beaches in Northern Oregon and they washed onto those beaches every day for two months. That is a lot of birds. So I'm gonna tell you the story of some of those really big mortality events. We call them mass mortality events um, and tests of the coast baseline. So three stories, one about harmful algal blooms, one about disease, and one about the marine heat wave. So the first story I wanna tell you is about surf scoters and white wing scoters. These are amazing sea ducks. Um, as you probably know, um, they breed uh, in uh, Canada and into um, Alaska, and they actually spread down both the East Coast and the West Coast during the non-breeding season. We have real jazz hands estimates of how many scoters there are in the world about 500,000 of each of those species, but it might be 400,000 to a million to uh, over a million. And that's because they're really pretty hard to accurately assess, certainly when they're um, in the nesting habitat and even um, when they're on the wintering grounds. In Washington state, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife flies planes along the outer coast uh, and in Puget Sound um, counting uh, surf scoters and, and white wing scoters. Um, their conservation concerns are mainly coastal, um, so coastal oil spills, toxics, um, but also habitat degeneration, both in the um, wintering zones and um, up in the breeding locations. Okay, so this is a story that happened in 2009, and uh, you are looking at a set of graphs that depict on the top graph um, a bloom of a particular single-celled algae. Uh, now those two stripes, the pink stripe and the blue stripe are two periods of time when we saw lots of carcasses coming ashore. The pink stripe is when we saw lots of uh, scoters coming ashore. And the blue stripe is when we saw murres, loons, and grebes coming ashore, predominantly as, um, as carcasses, as dead birds, but also as moribund birds. What are all of the squiggly colorly, colored lines that we see? Those are counts of cells um, uh, per liter times uh, 100,000. So a big um, event uh, like the Northern event arrow is pointing to, that's something uh, that yellow line happened at Quinault, um, which you can see on the map. That means that there are so many Akashiwo cells that's the single-celled algae that we're counting, that it literally turned the ocean a, a different color, turned the ocean red, uh, AKA a red tide. And what you can see is when those um, blooms, those red tides are high, that's when we're seeing birds come ashore. But we can also see events like the blue line in the middle at Twin Harbors, where there was a big bloom, but no carcasses coming to shore. So we know that cells are necessary, but not the only thing. We also figured out that you needed storm events and big waves. So that middle diagram is um, waves. Uh, so how high the waves are. And you can see that there were two storm events in the beginning of the Scoter die-off and one big storm event right at the beginning of the Merloon and Grieve die-off. What's the bottom graph? The bottom graph tells us something about which way the wind is blowing. Um, and what that told us is that 
When there are big storm events, the wind switches direction. We get onshore movement of the water. So all of those cells that have been growing out in the ocean get pushed right into the shore. What's all this mean? Well, in September of that year, the water was unseasonably warm. And that led to the bloom of this single-celled algae, Akashiwo sanguinea, at incredibly large numbers, but in the offshore environment. But during storm events, big uh, and onshore winds, onshore winds pushed the bloom onto shore. Uh, big waves broke those cells open. They released their cell contents, and their cell contents contained a surfactant or soap-like substance that was whipped by the waves into large foam. Uh, that foam covered the ocean for over 100 kilometers. Uh, of ocean. It was as deep as a meter. Um, it was sticky to the touch. It coated the feathers of birds and it caused uh, the natural oils of the feathers to be washed away so that those feathers collapse. It's as if suddenly a surfer with a wetsuit had that um, wetsuit melt away. You would die of exposure. And that's what was happening to the birds. So the scoters were coming ashore during the fall, but they were uh, literally freezing to death and onshore, they couldn't forage. And many, many, many of them died. Why didn't they just fly away? Well, right after breeding, after scoters come down and end up in their wintering environments where they have plenty of shellfish to feed on and fatten back up again, they go through a synchronous or catastrophic flight feather molt. So they had lost all of their flight feathers and they literally couldn't fly away. And the bloom event was so large, they couldn't uh, swim through it. We know uh, from our estimates that about uh, 5,800 surf scoters uh, washed in dead uh, in that event. And at the time that we uh, were documenting that, that was the largest documented die off of birds, of marine birds because of a harmful algal bloom anywhere in the world ever. Now I'm gonna tell you a story about disease. This is a story about rhinoceros auklet. So they're in a new family, the Alcid family, the football with wings family, uh, as you can see um, this rhino here on the top picture. The bottom rhino uh, is looking uh, pretty awful. That's a very, very sick bird um, floating very low in the water, can't even keep its head up. Uh, so there are more uh, rhinos in the world. There are about 1.5 million. They are concentrated along the West Coast uh, center of the population is up in BC. The largest colony in Washington state is Protection Island. There's a little gray arrow to Protection Island on that map there. Um, and you can see a photograph of Protection Island with a little circle on it. Um, that cutaway uh, cliff is where most of the rhinos are nesting. There are 72,000 of them nesting on Protection Island. So what happened to the rhinos? In 2016, uh, we started to see lots of rhinos washing ashore and moribund rhinos. This um, map here with the red circles on it tells you all of the beach locations that we're finding rhinoceros auklets. I've put an arrow there down to Protection Island. And what's really interesting about the auklets washing into the beaches um, in in Puget Sound, they're all within about 50 kilometers of Protection Island, which is about the foraging range uh, of rhinoceros auklets. On the left side, you can see um, the 2016 coast signal versus our long-term normal, which is that black line, this time with a green wash. So way, way outsized, way bigger than normal in the Salish Basin, but also in the outer coast, just moved forward by about a month. So those birds were not only dying in Puget Sound, um, come their post-breeding dispersal. They, dis they disperse out of the Salish Sea to along the coast. We were still seeing them die. What happened? Uh, well, coast surveys indicated, uh, collected about 527 of them. There were public additions because there are lots of people um, in the Salish Basin. Um, we now know that the outer coast signal shown in red here was about 20 times normal. Likely there was a mortality of many thousands. Um, of these birds. These birds all died of a massive bacterial infection or septicemia, um, combined with a late season decrease in their food supply, uh, in, in the fish supply. 
Again, we think that the um, warmer than normal waters contributed to um, the disease. And because those birds were literally cheek to jowl in that one cliff, 72,000 of them nesting together, there was a lot of transmission in the colony. And so lots of birds died. There were actually population consequences to this die off. Um, although we didn't see any apparent transmission to the much larger BC population that also comes down in winters uh, in the lower 48. Uh, we did see the lowest fledging success uh, um, on protection of any year um, in the year of the die off. Um, and this is because sick parents can't feed chicks. And so chicks are dying as well. But we also saw a 20% drop in burrow occupancy the following year, indicating that there was so much mortality that there were spots left over in the colony, even when new birds um, had already established themselves in the following year. This is a story about Casson's auklets. Casson's auklets are relative of rhinos. They're smaller. Um, and let me back up and tell you, and you may all know this, rhinoceros auklets are actually not auklets. They're, they're true puffins. So they are more closely related to tufted puffins and horn puffins than they are to auklets. So Casson's auklets, smaller, about the size of my fist, um, also burrow nesting birds. More of them, about 5.5 million uh, Casson's auklets in the world. Uh, you can see their distribution uh, in the Birds of North America map here. And I put a big star right at the northwest tip of Vancouver Island in BC. And that is to signify the Scott Island group. It's a group, an archipelago of five islands going out to Triangle Island, which is the fifth island out. Um, Triangle Island alone houses over 2 million uh, Casson's auklets. That island is so completely covered uh, with Casson's auklets that if you walk uh, on uh, Triangle uh, in the early evening when the Casson's are coming back, you have to wear uh, a full helmet and headgear because they'll um, they'll hit you in the face. So um, this bird um, is a bird that really caused us to, to think, oh my goodness, about mass mortality events. So this is a coast trace. What I've done here is take the long-term normal signal and I printed it over every single year. So it looks a little bit like an EKG or a heart monitor graphic. And that's just because you're seeing that same baseline signal. This is in Northern Oregon. So you can see that same signal that I showed you, the two hump mountain pattern and all of those gray bars that more or less follow along the long-term normal until we get to that one catastrophic signal, that way not normal signal that I showed you slightly earlier in the presentation. So it turns out those weren't all dead birds, just one kind of dead bird, Casson's auklets shown here. So here's a live Casson's auklet, but here's a whole compilation of dead auklets. Coasters were finding so many on the beach that they were sending us uh, big pictures like this one. In fact, the high count was 286 Cassins per kilometer um, in, in Northern Oregon. So that's a truly catastrophic or mass mortality signal. What was happening? Well, uh, by 2014-15, there was a marine heat wave that hit the Northeast Pacific. This is warmer than normal water sitting on top uh, of the Northeast Pacific as a lens. And once that water took up residence, it stayed there for a few years. Um, it eventually occupied a territory of the Northeast Pacific that was about the size of continental Canada, very large. And at its peak, it was four degrees Celsius warmer than normal. So that is, that is very big. So that amount of space and that amount of warmth and that amount of time was enough to change the ecosystem. So the North Pacific ecosystem changed the prey base, the little things in the um, trophic food web that seabirds like Casson's auklets eat. Among them, copepods, shown here in the top photograph, and krill, or small shrimp-like organisms, shown here in the bottom. So what are these complicated graphics that are on the left-hand side? The um, black line is a trace of sea surface temperature anomaly. So anomaly, zero is normal, plus is warmer than normal, negative is colder than normal. And we've put dashed lines to show you the upwelling season. So in the Pacific Northwest, 
during the spring, the direction of the wind shifts uh, and wind pushes the water predominantly offshore. That offshore pressure causes water from deep to well up, hence the term upwelling, coastal upwelling, and that deep water is colder than normal. So you can see that during the upwelling season, framed by those dashed lines, the water is colder than normal. But suddenly at the end of the upwelling season, it shot up to warmer than normal, very, very quickly over one day. Uh, and when that happened, there was a transition in the copepods, the top graph. So the red copepods, the northern copepods went down and the blue copepods, the southern copepods went up. Why do we care about that? Northern copepods are big, fat, high energy food source. Southern copepods are small. Um, energy food source. At the same time, we can see that the krill, the bottom graph on, in red, uh, decreased in size. So when we had changes in sea surface temperature conditions, uh, copepods changed in species and krill got much smaller. Uh, and these conditions caused many, many hundreds of thousands of cassins to starve to death. Our best estimate is that there are about 400,000 Cassin's Auklets lost their lives in this one event, or about 8 to 10% of the entire world's population of Cassin's. Here's the final um, mortality event I'm going to share with you this evening, common MERS. And this leaves me thinking, will common MERS be common in the future? So there are a lot of common MERS in the world, 18 million of them. They actually uh, live in both the Pacific and Atlantic basins. In the Pacific, they're breeding all the way down um, past Monterey Bay in California and then up into uh, the Bering Sea. We see them in the Chukchi, but they are less um, abundant there. And there's a congener species, the thick-billed MER that takes over there. So this is one of the larger alces at about a kilogram. Uh, and um, this is also the densest nesting bird uh, in the world. So that heat wave that started in 1415 and did in so many Cassin's auklets continued on its rampage um, up the food chain to MERS. So while Cassin's are eating smaller insect-sized things, MERS are fish eaters or passivorous. Uh, seabirds. They're eating sort of pizza-sized fish like anchovies or, or herring uh, or sand lance um, or smelt shown here. So that blob of warmer than uh, normal temperatures, and you can see that colorized map of that warm water lens just sitting there over the top of the Northeast Pacific, uh, not only caused changes in copepods and krill, but also ch caused changes in the forage fish these fish that MERS eat. And by the way, they're the same kinds of fish that are eaten by marine mammals and the same kinds of fish that are eaten by large fish like the pollock shown here. So what happened to the forage fish? They didn't grow as fast, so they were smaller in size. Uh, there were shifts in which species were predominant. And very importantly, they stayed deeper in the water column. So a bird that has to basically expel breath and dive underwater and swim underwater to catch um, forage fish prey is gonna have to expend more energy to dive deeper. How about a fish like a pollock? Well, if the forage fish come down deeper in the water column, pollock have it easier. So it's easier for them to eat. But there's another thing, a super interesting uh, me metabolic thing that happened. Birds are homeothermic, right? They keep a constant temperature but fish are not, fish are porkilothermic. So when the water warmed, when the water temperature warmed, the bodies of those big predatory fish like pollock warmed up. And when a big fish warms up even a few degrees, its metabolism increases. And when its metabolism increases, it needs more to eat. So effectively that big blob of warm ocean was doing two things. It was um, reducing the availability of prey fish, and it was increasing the hunger of predatory fish. And those two things caused predatory fish to outcompete MERS. So MERS lost their life. We now know that about 4 million birds, MERS, uh, lost their life, predominantly in the colonies of Alaska. That's 20 to 25% of the world's population 
we believe that that is the largest documented mortality event, single mortality event of homeotherms. So organisms that keep their temperature documented anywhere in the world ever. Are there bigger lessons for all of this? I think there are. So COAST is a big citizen science program, but we're not the only citizen science program. I mentioned British Columbia Beach Bird Survey, BCBBS, which you can see in light purple here on this map. We also have two uh, beach bird programs to the south of us um, in central and into Southern California, Beach Watch and Beach Combers. All four of our programs are interoperable, which means we collect data in the same way. So when we see these events, we collect all of the data into sort of a big statistical pot so we can do analyses together. So that's four citizen science programs over 29 years because the other programs actually started before COAST looking at 90,000 surveys. That is big data in citizen science. What have we seen? Well, I'm gonna, show you some of the mass mortality events that I've just told you about. There have been others. I'm going to put them on this railroad track timeline that stretches from 2006 to 2021. Each one of them is going to be a circle. The size of the circle tells you something about how many birds died. Uh, the color of the circle tells you something about what family of birds uh, they belong to, and I'm putting a little thumbnail picture of those birds. So you can see that even before the ocean warmed, there were all kinds of mass mortality events, very colorful, lots of different species. But once the ocean got stuck on warm, which you can see here, um, only birds in the sort of pink range, the alcids, and the blue range, the prosolarias or the tube nose birds died. So ocean warming did a few things. It focused in on certain families of birds. It caused mass mortality events to be more frequent and it caused them to be much larger. We can take all those mass mortality events, the largest ones are these red circles, um, and we can put them together in something that we call event magnitude. That's the total number of birds we think died, the total amount of coastline they died over, and the number of months that die-off went on. So a long-term, very large, lots of birds event is a high magnitude event. Notice that that y-axis is a log scale. So between one and a thousand is three orders of magnitude. That's a big, big, big difference. What's on the x-axis or the horizontal axis? Sea surface temperature anomaly, right? How warm the ocean is. So zero is normal and into the red is warmer than normal towards the blue is colder than normal. What can you see here? You can see here that once we get above long-term normal zero, there's a little step function or a quick step up in event magnitude that's over a whole order of magnitude. For instance, from 10 to 100, or here from about 20 to 200. Let me translate this for you. Basically, when the ocean temperature goes up one degree and stays up for six months of time, the ecosystem is gonna lose millions of marine birds. That's a big lesson. We also know these mass mortality events happen in double sets, right? The um, traces you're looking at here are three different double mass mortality events that have happened in the lower 48 um, in 1997-98, uh, in 2015-16, and in 2019 uh, and 20. And what we can see here from this is when a uh, marine heat wave happens, indicated by the dashed line, we see one mass mortality event that lasts, starts about six months later and lasts for six to 10 months. Then we see another one a year later, um, also lasting about six months. And then super interesting, we see uh, fewer carcasses than normal. So where people were finding lots and lots of carcasses for the next 16 to 18 months, everybody will find less than normal. What we now know is that it takes the coastal ecosystem about three years to shake out the effects of a marine heat wave with a one-two punch of mortality and then about a 16-month um, return to normal. So that three-year stretch of the seabird ecosystem paying attention to uh, 
a uh, marine heat wave means that we really have to think about how quickly these heat waves happen. They used to happen every 50 years, then they happen about every 20 years. Now they seem to be happening as frequently as every five or even three years. And if they're happening that quickly, we know that what we're seeing is a dramatic change in the ecosystem and one that's going to support fewer seabirds in the future. So there are two future threats to marine birds within the um, coastal Pacific Northwest that I just wanna mention, um, highly pathogenic avian influenza and offshore wind farms. And I'm asking again, the theoretical question, are coast or beach bird data relevant to these future threats. So some of you may know that HPAI, highly pathogenic avian influenza is already here. It's been resident in the North Atlantic for a while. Um, it has done, uh, done in colonies um, of gannets there, um, also, of, um, also of MERS. This past year, there was a um, large mortality event on Rat Island in Jefferson County, which you can see um, I'm pointing that to Rat Island. It's right above Indian Island um, and next to Marrowstone. You can see the red uh, arrow pointing to it. There is a Caspian Tern colony um, on Rat. Uh, and last year, about um, half the adults uh, on that colony uh, died, um, about 11,000 adults, um, and also about 5,000, or excuse me, 500 uh, chicks. That's a very, very local signal. Um, in fact, we had uh, experts from Washington Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife um, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service that were um, handling that event and, and keeping people away because there were questions about um, species transference. That uh, next map that you can see is a coast map. All those blue dots are coast uh, survey sites um, and none of them had any Caspian terns in them except for the ones with the big red dots. Um, and the big red dots um, are right at the um, Columbia River. There are also Caspian Tern colonies uh, in the Columbia River. So what Coast picked up is far away from Rat Island, but what we picked up is a regional signal. And that's because Caspian Terns are uh, long-lived seabirds and they move around over time and they remember where are the where all the colonies are. So these birds that were dispersing from Rat Island were dispersing and going and visiting the other colonies, including the ones in the lower Columbia. So that trace, and now you're very familiar with the heartbeat curve, that's a trace of um, Caspian Tern encounter rate. And you can see that regional signal for 2023 was about 20 times normal. So beach bird surveys do allow us to see um, what's going on in these very, very pointed uh, disease events. Not, uh, not only the septicemia events like the rhino story that I told you earlier, but also HPAI events. We also are worried about offshore wind. Now, let me back up and say, I am actually not against offshore wind. I think offshore wind farms are part of a platform of sustainable energy and sustainable futures that we have to embrace. But there are a lot of questions about where to place those wind farms relative to what's going on in the coastal ecosystem, including um, breeding and um, wintering dispersal of birds. So we are busy using um, coast data married with a uh, oceanographic modeling program to understand if we place wind farms in particular locations and they uh, kill birds through um, uh, running into the turbines, where those carcasses are gonna go and we can model that over time, which I'm showing you with a mock-up um, in, the, in these middle traces here. We can, that also allows us to understand how much sampling, how many beaches, how often sampled we need to be able to tell a difference um, in that mortality signature. Do we wanna see a 10% difference? We gotta add a lot of beaches in. Are we happy with a 30% difference? Maybe not so many. The other thing that wind farms are doing, and we know this from um, uh, the North Sea, is that some birds like loons tend to avoid places altogether when wind farms go in. So they're not gonna collide with the wind farms because they just give up that habitat entirely. So we not only have to think about mortality, we actually have to think about the absence of birds. We would see that as a loss of the coast signal, for instance, of loons. So beach bird sampling can get us both more than normal and also less than normal. So, 
I probably thoroughly depressed you at this point because I'm just killing birds right and left in the Pacific Northwest. But I'm telling you, it's not all bad. So doing coast surveys um, also allow moments of joy. And I wanna share one of them with you. This is species number 183, the purple gallinule. Here's that bird live. Here's the wing uh, of a purple gallinule that was found on Hobuck Beach. You can see the star of that. That's on the um, Macaw Reservation. Uh, now this Birds of North America map shows you where uh, purple gallinules are breeding and dispersing. And I can tell you it is not to the Pacific Northwest, but every now and then we get a stray. And this is one of the most amazing strays that we've ever seen. And because we have lots and lots and lots of beaches that are sampled and sampled every month, we have all sorts of very, very interesting and very rare birds. This wing was the um, first time anybody had documented purple gallinule in, um, in Washington. And so we got that new species in Washington. So there are some really interesting serendipitous things that we find in coast. So what's the goal of all of this? Well, the goal for me is science, right? I'm a scientist and I'm standing on the shoulders of hundreds and hundreds of people that are collecting rigorous, rigorous information and allowing me to do the science. But it's also community empowerment because telling those stories locally lets people be in the know about what, what's going on in their beaches and their region and make local decisions about what to do. It's also enjoyment. People get, uh, join citizen science programs because they like what's going on. Not only do they like surveying beaches, they like finding out about the natural history uh, of dead birds, but they also like knowing that they are contributing to something to a, a larger cause, a scientific cause. And it's also education. They get to know birds in different ways. But I would say that all of these things, science, community empowerment, enjoyment, and education can go into responsible resource management in a warming world, which is what I think we really need right now. So what? Here's eight reasons that coast makes a difference, at least in my book. Climate impacts, and I've talked about some of them tonight. Oil spill modeling, I didn't talk about that, um, but we do that. Harmful algal blooms, wind farm sighting and impact monitoring, fishery bycatch and fishery competition, disease outbreaks, marine debris. We have a whole marine debris program. And of course, we're worried about marine debris because of ingestion and entanglement impacts. And also, and honestly, cool, unexpected things. So thanks so much uh, for joining me tonight and letting me talk to you about COAST. I'm really excited to answer uh, questions if you have um, easy ones for me. Otherwise, I'm Happy to talk about dead birds. All questions will be easy <laughs> for you. For you, um, can I start off? There, there are a couple of questions. I'm going to give uh, our astounded audience a little time to uh, put theirs into words and tap them into the chat box. I mean, this is just extraordinary to see how sophisticated and well reasoned this whole study is, and. Uh, your coasters, I mean, they're drawn in by this social aspect of it as well, right? They, they I go to my beach and yeah. I get to do something that's part of a much larger process. Yeah. Yeah, Elaine, you, you are so right. You know, when I started Coast, I only thought we'd get, you know, maybe a few 12 year old boys <laughs> who wanted to throw carcasses around at each other. I couldn't really imagine that people, uh, real people would want to do dead birds, but I was really wrong. And I got to tell you, um, uh, maybe 20%, 15, 20% of coasters are in two or three generation families. So they do coast as a family activity. So that's really amazing. Uh, we have three marriages we know of where people met in coast on the beach while surveying dead birds together, fell in love, got married, sent out invitations with dead birds on them, right? So not only is it a family event, it's a romantic endeavor as well. I think, Julia, you need to add one of those invitations to your presentation. Uh, <laughs> it puts I a whole new dimension to it. Okay. <laughs> uh, may, may I remind our wonderful audience that there are a number of uh, references pasted in. One of the ones I like best is uh, one from the National Academy of Sciences uh, presentation that Dr. Parrish gave. And then there's Bird Note. And we, we will nick um, 
what's his name? <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, great. Steve Hampton. You may know Steve Hampton. Yeah, here. I see. He's asked yeah. a question here about um, observing oil on beach cast birds. Right. That's a that's a great question. Yeah, we do. And in fact, there are if you go to the coast website to um, news and views, you can get to the blog. There's a good blog on um, chronic oiling. Um, so uh, chronic oiling is when we get mystery oiling, right? There's no oil spill that anybody reports, but we'll get um, oil birds coming in, usually just in ones, occasionally in twos. Uh, so we have a concentration of chronic oiling events around the mouth of the Columbia River, and a second one a mouth around the strait, uh, mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And that's pretty obvious when you think about it because those are where shipping routes are concentrated. Uh, so we think that that um, we think that that's what's going on. We have used coast baselines to test against um, oiling events, um, including the Tenyamaru oil spill, the Nestucca, um, and the New Carissa. Um, and so we've uh, we've published on that um, as well. And there, we're not looking at encounter rate differences. We're actually looking at um, differences in the species distribution, because it, it turns out that there are some species that are really prone to oiling, like MERS, and there are other species that are much less prone to oiling, like prosilureids. Um, and we think that has actually a lot to do just with the distribution of birds um, in the offshore environment. Oh. Great question. Uh, let's see, our data from the offshore pelagic seabird, like the Westport Seabirds Cruises, and earlier data from surveys initiated in the 70s by folk like Dennis and Terry being used useful for citing offshore wind farms. Yes, Ooh. absolutely. Yes, that the Westport um, data set is actually the longest offshore single line um, uh, marine bird sighting data set uh, along the West Coast. It is so fantastically useful. Um, and um, we do... Uh, we do use that a lot. We combine that with um, aerial surveys and boating surveys that WDFW does, but those were started much more recently. So we basically, the only way we pull back in time is with uh, Westport surveys. Yeah, I, I've used those data multiple times. It's just amazing, um, an amazing data set. Let's see. I think... I think that's about all you guys asked. May, may I may I ask one that's it's really not seabird or death. Um, <laughs> that's I, okay. I, I love that you continue. I shouldn't say continue. I, I love that you have held the term citizen science. Yeah. As as the nom, nom, nomenclature for this, um, there's been as we all know a tendency to uh, lean over towards community science in a, in a good way. But uh, do you have any comments you can share with yeah, us? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, I have to say, I, uh, I make a difference between citizen science and community science. Uh, and that's because I work in communities. Um, and community science has a long, strong tradition. Uh, and in community science, communities are asking the questions, right? Uh, they are wondering what's uh, about what's going on. And they may reach out to scientists to help them answer questions. But um, community science is practiced in community by, with, and for communities. Citizen science has a much larger geographic expanse. So I work in about 90 different coastal communities, um, but I am not deeply embedded in any one of them. And so we use the term citizen science for that larger grouping uh, and community science we reserve for um, communities that are doing that science. So there's things called community-based participatory research, CBPR, community-owned and monitored research, COMR, C-O-M-R, and the communities that do that work and have done that work for a long time, they, they want to push back and say, no, 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 don't, don't take don't take our phrase, right? Right. Um, oh, I wanted... so I think that's important. The other thing that I would say, Elaine, is that although there's been some pushback, people saying, well, you know, citizen is not an entirely friendly term because we have people who aren't citizens who live here um, in, in this country. And when you're doing science, I don't think you're a citizen of the country. I think you're a citizen of the planet. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna distill that and carry that in my pocket. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, if there's anyone else, I know we've got several 
thank you. This was so illuminating and, and uh, much appreciated. Um, any other questions are very welcome. And I can't actually, figure out how to put a question in. Oh, actually, you're doing just the right thing now. Uh, but for future <laughs> reference, you type it into the thing where it says chat. But go, we love voices. Oh, I, I, yeah, it says meeting group chat, and that's all I get. I can't put the question in. Could could you go ahead? You can just ask it out loud. Can you um can you trace where the oil is coming from that you find on uh, these birds? Oh, that's a great question. That's a CSI question. Um, yeah, oh. right. The oil fingerprinting, right? Uh, we yeah. hear a lot about that uh, during oil spills. And for chronic oiling, no, no, we can't. Um, and usually those birds are not freshly oiled, but um, long oiled. So uh, oil fingerprinting has been used um, in oil spills to basically prove that the oil that's coming ashore came from the vessel it's leaking from. But we don't really have enough technology to um, fingerprint uh, the, the chronic oiling. But it would be amazing if we could do that, right? Um, because you, you really want to know um, what's going on and whether it's all ships just leaking a little bit, right? Or it's some bad actors in the shipping fleet. That would be a really interesting thing to try and figure out. Great yeah. question. Some some yes. wonderkin is working on that for his PhD, right? Now. I hope so. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, we we want to thank you. You're you're our champion of change. I think one of the environmental hero when you shook Al Gore's hand or something. I did, like that. yeah. Appreciate it so much, Julia. Well, thanks, Elaine. Thanks, thanks David. And um, thanks, WASP members. Uh, really great. Um, keep up the great birding. I think you might find some uh, signups to that online training on April 21st. Absolutely. Yeah. Please go to the Coast website. We're just happy to come to your community, assuming it's a coastal one. Right. Thanks so much. Best wishes. Thank you. Okay.